and get back in our Father's Word, chapter 4, the great book of Revelation. We have finished uh, with the seven churches, finding two of them pleasing to Christ and five not. So it really doesn't take, you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the drawer to know what you should have taught in your church. Because if your church isn't teaching what Smyrna and Philadelphia were teaching, you're in a heap of hurt, okay? So having said that, we come to chapter 4, and um, we, many people are going to tell you that the first verse of chapter 4 has to do with the rapture, okay? That the church is not mentioned anymore, so it's raptured there. Now, first of all, a child knows that the church has no article in verse 1. I mean, it's not part of the subject. So don't let some knucklehead come along and insert something that isn't there. Listen to your father's word, exactly what it says, how it reads, and that's what you want to believe. Don't believe what some con artist tries to slip in to the, the manuscripts that simply is a, uh, an excuse that he does not know. The church is mentioned again in chapter 22. Church members are mentioned throughout the book of Revelation. Not as specific churches, but the memberships thereof, especially if they worship Almighty God, are mentioned over and over and over. Many times, even as God's saints, set aside ones. So, having said that, let's begin with chapter 4, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. And let's see how you read, if you can absorb, uh, or if you listen to some yo-yo. Okay. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, does this say, what, what is I? I is John, okay, the writer of this book of Revelation. John is not a church. John is an entity. The door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I'm going to show you the future. Now, where was this door open? We've been taken, we were taken to the Lord's Day in chapter 1, verse 10. And we have been showing what was happening here on earth. Now, we're going to go to heaven. John is going to go up and he's going to report on what he sees there. And again, there is no article for the church. Church is not the subject. The subject, I mean, the, the one taken is John, whereby he can report to us what the future holds. And after all, isn't that what Revelation is about? The unfold veiling to make known? Of course it is. So, um, again, that trumpet being the voice of God deep, clear, rich. Verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And of course, this being the throne of God, instantly he was there, just as promised. So now we switch from earth to heaven, but the time sequence is the same. Don't let that get away from you. Hang on to it. First day of the millennium. Okay. And events that happened just prior to that and things that will happen after that. Hang on to that. We're in heaven now. Okay. Three. Same time period. And he that, and he that set was to look up, look up on like a jasper in a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow about around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. This is the Shekinah glory hovering around Almighty God, bringing its presence. 
the jasper and the sardine are the first and the last stone of a chief uh, of a, a, a priest's breast, okay? Breastplate. The twelve stones set there, the first and the last. And here this beautiful sight is before John. You're at the altar of God. That's what, where is heaven? Heaven is wherever God is. Doesn't matter where he is, that's heaven. Verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Wearing this white raiment, white raiment in heaven is made up of your righteous acts, okay? If you have a lot of righteous acts, then you have a rather large white robe, because the robe is woven from your righteous acts, documenting that these 24 were worthy. Um, I, I feel and teach, and we'll have to wait till we get there to find out, but I have little doubt in my mind that 12 of these 24 are the 12 patriarchs, that's to say the fathers of Israel. The other 12 are the apostles. And you can call that an educated guess or whatever you wish to. And many might think Mathis or Judas, which will actually be in the twelve. And you want to be real careful that you don't set yourself up as judge because even Judas himself repented before he died. So, and, and play, playing that negative part. So you want to be real careful and not judge. But I feel beyond a doubt that that's the 24. <clears throat> Okay, we go to the next verse, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now we'll find out in the next chapter who these seven spirits are, okay, these seven spirits of God. We'll pick that up in chapter 5, probably in the next lecture. Hang on to that thought. Verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass. That's clear purity. Like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. This uh, beast is really a kind of a, a bad translation of zun or zoi from the Hebrew. Zun in Greek, zoi in, in Hebrew. Of the living creatures, which is to say cherubims. They were cherubims that our Father had. You, or wherever you see the throne of God, you'll see them because they do not allow Satan or anyone else to try, try to take authority over that throne. Does God need protectors? Well, he, he had one at one time, and it was the cherub that covereth. His name was Satan, called Tyrus. He went bad. So God created the Zun, which have, have uh, I do not believe, have any ability to not to do anything but love God. They're not human. Therefore, they do not have the ability to create love within themselves and to let that love flow outward. And there they are, but they are good entities. They're not beasts, as you think of beasts, but are living creatures and accomplish a, a very good work, okay? Uh, next verse, verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth, fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now, what you want to understand 
is that here you have the encampment of Israel at night. In other words, it's symbolic of God's children. Um, naturally, if you ever want to check this out, check out Numbers chapter 2, verse 2. But let me just explain to you that if you go to the north of the encampment, you will, um, you will find, of course, Dan there. That's an eagle. The eagle is the, the symbol of that tribe. And if you go to the west, you'll find Ephraim, which is an ox. Ox straight-legged, okay. And if you go to the south, you find a man's face, and that man is Reuben, the eldest of the twelve sons. And naturally, if you go to the north, you find a lion. And that lion, of course, is symbolic of the tribe of Judah. So here, you simply, through these creatures, they not only are protecting the throne, but, but all of God's children, because God loves his children. And, uh, and they are represented there. That is the throne from which the ruling is done. And our Father being the ruler thereof. So when something sounds foreign, multi-headed, then you need to take a close look at it and go into the simplicity which will bear out in the scriptures themselves. This would be based, again, I'll repeat, from Numbers chapter 2, verse 2, forward. Verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. In other words, God is the same yesterday, he is today, and he shall be forever. That's something you can count on as our Father. Man will change on you. God won't. God will always be there. Now this sounds so really difficult. Uh, they had six wings? How could they have wings? Well, do you remember... I want to take you, if I may, to Ezekiel chapter 1, where God's altar showed up at a different place. Showed up by the river Kibar, in the Hebrew tongue means a length of time. And this all has to do with a length of time. But let's understand what we're dealing with here and what is being said. Let's look at the creatures and see from the Old Testament that nothing is new under the sun. We're going to begin with chapter 1, verse 4 of Ezekiel. You'll have it on the screen. And it reads, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. This word amber in the Hebrew tongue is highly polished bronze. In other words, out of this mist came a highly polished bronze vehicle. Well, how could you say vehicle? Well, because the altar of God was aboard it. Okay. No, there's no mystery in that. It is solid in the manuscripts. And, um, and so it is. Now, uh, I want to prepare you that Ezekiel has probably never seen anything higher tech than an ox cart. And he'll be trying to relate these wheels that he sees, disc, to the wheels of an ox cart. Okay, verse 5. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. The zo same one, Zoi, okay? And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. There you have old Reuben, six. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. 
not six, four wings. Why? These were landed. The two make landing gear. Got it? Seven. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, straight-legged, okay, like a landing gear naturally is. Uh, it was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Why? Because it, it was highly polished bronze, appeared to be. Verse 8. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Now here we go again into the explanation and the reason I brought you here. Verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. In other words, um, Ezekiel was used to riding a, a donkey. And if you're going to turn a donkey, you turn his head and he looks that way and goes that way. These things didn't have a head. They were circular and if it decided to go this way, that way or what, it just went. Okay. And he's doing a good job of explaining that. They look not where they went. Let's go with the next verse, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion. The man would be Reuben, of course. The lion, of course, would be the tribe of Judah to the north. And um, the, um, the face, let's see, the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and their four had the face of an ox on the left. The ox would be um, would be Reuben, and they four also had the face of an eagle, which uh, which would be Dan. Okay, to the to the other direction. So here you have the same layout of God's children encampment at night, and all this protection of God's altar. His bringing his altar to this earth in this particular case. This is opposite of Revelation because in Revelation we went to heaven to see the altar. Here the altar of God came to us at the river Kibar. Okay, and, um, and so it is. One more verse. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and the two covered their bodies. And of course, where they went, they went straight forward and so forth. Later, it would say there were uh, uh, rings, which is to say windows. And you could see people inside those windows. And when these discs turned, the people turned with it, naturally, because they were aboard. So we see a definition of God's control of God's people. God never forgets his children. Do you know why he created you? For his pleasure. He wanted someone just like you, but he wants you to love him. He doesn't want you to do as Satan and many others have done, is rebel. What, like rebellious children can do. He wants you to love him because he has always cared, he always will. And he always has this double protection, always remembering his children. And we have technologies that man here on earth that still must burn old type fuel, you know, to even get a shuttle off the earth, we've got to burn a little carbon stuff, you know, to blow a little smoke in the air. There is forms of energy that we don't understand yet, but we shall, and time will come that we will know these things. Our Father is far advanced, but then man in his awkwardness has come a long way, but very awkward compared to our Father his love for his children. Returning now to chapter 4 of the great book of Revelation, let's pull up the next verse, if we may, verse 9. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks, 
to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. They had no choice other than to do this. This is why the beast, the zone, zoom, were created for that purpose. Okay. And listen very carefully, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, one, and honor, two, and power, three. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. N nothing created to offend. But when God created people who had the ability to love or hate, he only wanted the real thing. Meaning those that the love originated within the entity, within the person, and went outward to our Heavenly Father. There's something very unusual about this particular verse. Each, um, each uh, thing described here, glory, honor, and power, has an article. Okay, It's got an article meaning it makes it very separate, of which you can say the triune Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the power and the love on which they operate. Meaning, in the manuscripts, the article, if we were speaking Hebrew, it would be eth, okay, such as I have taught you concerning eth ha-adam, the article before ha and um, here, however, in the Greek, we have the glory, the honor, and the power. Because when you get right down to it, there is no other power. There is no other honor, and there is no other glory. Unless it be the glory from Almighty God, or you that are in Him, and He in you, that that glory abounds. That love reaches out. That love brings in. That love that God created all things for his pleasure. That he can enjoy his creation. And you're a part of it. You know, your soul does belong to him. And thus it is written in Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4. All souls belong to God. You don't get around to giving it to him. He created it. It's his. He owns you. He owns your soul. And again, it makes it a little, uh, I think it should make it a little easier to love and to understand him when you realize he created you for his pleasure. He enjoys you. He wants you to be near him, to love him. That gives him pleasure, and when you hear me say many times, you give God pleasure, he will return that pleasure. You make his day, he'll make yours. Why, well, you're his child. And there is no better way than the description of his very altar itself with the, the, the um, memorial that is always there concerning his children. The ox, the lion, the eagle, uh, and, and the man. Letting you know he's thinking of his children and their encampment, their safety, their security, what happens to them. It's always there before him. He, he loves his children. He loves his creation. He loves his world. And you're, a, you're part of that family. How precious it is when we think about that. Now let's get right on into the next chapter. Chapter 5 verse 1 And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written wherein within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Those seven seals we're going to learn because someone has the authority to open them to us. 
This is the same, if we had kept reading in the book of Ezekiel, if we had gone to chapter 2, we would have had this same book. It was brought forth there. And we're supposed to teach that book. And we're told in the book of Ezekiel that people have a iron forehead or a, a, a stone forehead and they're, they're not going to listen to you. But you give them the book anyway. You give them the word. They may not like it, but you give it to them. Okay, anyway, that's the book we're talking about here. Ezekiel 2.9, you can read of it. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Who is it? Well, it certainly wouldn't be Lucifer. Three, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able, this is a state of degradation, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Didn't happen until the time that B.C. changed to A.D. Okay. A.D. of B.C. is before Christ, and A.D. is um, Anno Domino, which is to say the year of our Lord. When the year of our Lord came by, there was someone able. For, and I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereupon. And you know something, if we were to, without the blood of the Lamb, who would be worthy to understand it today? I mean, really take inventory now and answer that question. And see what, how much difference the blood of the Lamb makes in your life today. Verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And of course, that lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus Christ himself. He has prevailed. He has defeated death. He has defeated the grave even. Where is your victory? And that key of David again unlocks the locks that lock the truth um, within and loose it whereby in your mind that seal can come into your mind with clarity and with understanding whereby the simplicity of God's word unfolds before your very eyes. And you can see that same key that God's saints possess, that simply means the set aside ones that care, that love him, that want to see that truth then they understand those seven spirits of God which were sent forth to all the earth. That key is a precious key. That key opens and no man can shut. Let's go with the next verse, please. Six. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. What are those seven spirits of God? Well, we're going to find out, but have you ever read the great book of Zechariah? In the third and the fourth chapter, where you come to that place um, where the sons of oil are even brought forth, and prior to that, the stone that has seven pairs of eyes. It's the eyes of God's elect, the, the Zadok, those that see the truth. And you begin to see the warmth and compassion and love that God has for those that he can send forth with truth so that that truth opens seals. That is to say that brings truth forth that that could not be seen into plain sight with understanding to those that have eyes to see and ears to hear the very word of God 
Verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odas, od odas and which are the prayers of the saints. Don't you ever tell me that your prayers aren't heard by God. They're even bottled. Anything that has ever offended God's people, it's bottled. That prayer is there if that prayer went up. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Whomsoever will, whomsoever will. What song were they singing? The song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32 that you sing those that conquer the world and are on their way to be with Almighty God. Verse 10, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Reign, what, a thousand years, a millennium, the Lord's day, the day we were taken to in chapter 1, verse 10, 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands of thousands. Well, I only thought a hundred and forty-four thousand was supposed to make it. Well, you thought wrong. Only set aside ones, forget it. Verse 12, it's innumerable. You can't count them. Verse 12 to complete. Saying with a loud voice, listen carefully. You want to know what the seven spirits of God are mixed in with those seven that have eyes to see, that understand the seals, that has the mark of God in their very forehead? Listen. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, one, and riches, two, and wisdom, three, and strength, four, and honor five, and glory six, and blessing seven. Those seven spirits of God that go forth with those that have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the will to be servants of the living God. You know, how do you become a servant? You serve. To be willing to serve Almighty God, to love Him. After all, if He created you for His pleasure, uh, what really have you done for him lately? Hmm? You know, what he wants more than anything, it's not difficult. What he wants more than anything else is your love. For you to tell him you love him. And that's what every father wants of his children. Nothing unusual about that. So don't forget to remember him who created all and sent his seven spirits in his 7,000, which means spiritual completeness, that's all it means, seven. That spiritual completeness that brings in, that enfolds, that holds, that loves, okay? Be sure and let him know that you love him today. Won't you do that? All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?